Well, I don't think anyone can pretend to be happy with the situation in the United States. Dramatically increasing cases up till today, Friday, the 3rd of July. So doing quite well here. Lockdown measures were working. Then we have a, a great increase in cases and that is still carrying on at the moment. And the reason that this is so significant is we are starting to see now an increase in deaths in the United States. So the deaths came down quite dramatically. Quite gratifying reduction in rate, but we're now starting to see an increase in case of deaths. And I fear because of the increase in cases, the increasing number of uh, people being diagnosed positive, we're going to see increasing deaths lagging behind that. There's always a lag, but the number of Deaths are, are going to increase, unfortunately. Anyway, welcome to this uh, update. As we've uh, suggested so far, we're concentrating on the United States at the moment. Now, first thing I've noticed today was the weather is very hot in the US, virtually everywhere, I think, especially in the central and southern areas. So this seems to indicate that the weather is not going to protect us against COVID-19. The weather is not going to be a big factor in reducing cases. Now, we had hoped there'd be more seasonality as the summer increased, but that has not transpired to be the case. So that's that's uh, unfortunate. Now, the, the testing in the United States at the moment um, is, is under strain in some areas. Some of the labs are very busy and some states are actually pretty full. And of course, Testing outside in, in the hot weather when it's 100 degrees or so outside is not an easy thing to do. So there's been practical difficulties with that. Testing's very roughly speaking about half a million per day. But the plan is to increase that to one million per day by September. Now, the, the good thing about dramatically increasing the testing like this is it means you could perhaps test before an event or test a particular workforce, which would be useful. Now, I'm, I'm so concerned about the increase in cases in the States. I've actually drawn out this, uh, drawn it out in sort of words and numbers. So Thursday, the 25th of June, this was actually a, a record day. Um, that was a record day then. Uh, then that was another record day then. Then it went down slightly. But in the last uh, three days, we've had records uh, every, every day. That was a record that was a record, and 2nd of July, that was a record. So breaking the 50,000 new cases per day mark on Wednesday, the 1st of July. And unfortunately, for the next week or so, or, or indeed we don't know how long, that, that number, I would predict, is going to increase because of the very well-established community spread. So there's no real question that unfortunately we're going to see greatly increasing cases in the United States uh, for the immediate future. Cases now, um, we're heading towards the 3 million mark, well over the 2.5 million mark. Deaths 128,740 at the latest figures. Now there was a great increase in uh, after Memorial Day. A lot of people are starting to say, well, Memorial Day triggered off a lot of cases. And of course, tomorrow is the, the 4th of July, so Independence Day. So um, many people are being forced to stay in by the extremely hot weather, which I suppose in a sense is good. But given the increase in cases after Memorial Day, anxiety has to be high about increases in cases after Independence Day. Now, Mr. Trump is thinking about wearing a mask. He says he's thinking about it. Now, this is excellent. Now, why doesn't he wear a mask with, um, and this is this is perfectly serious. Wear a mask. See, I, I don't care as long as he wears a mask. Wear, wear, wear a mask as a campaign slogan. So have a make America great again on your mask or a flag of the United States or, or a picture of your of yourself, anything. You use the mask as, as an attribute. And while we're on that point, it just amazes me that more people aren't using masks as advertising. Um, I, can't, I can't understand why stores aren't giving out masks with their advertising logos on it. I'm sure that will come, and, and I'm sure they won't. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure I won't be recognised for 
I'm probably not the first to think of it, but um, but no, sit seriously. Um, if the problem is, it, as I see it, as I understand it, I'm a foreigner, but as I understand it, in the United States, wearing a mask has become political. This this is just crazy. The Surgeon General. I've just seen a news clip. This is the Surgeon General. I'm begging you, wear a face covering. And of course, when I say mask, I mean face covering to take away the momentum of the air. The Surgeon General is begging you to wear a mask. And the President is, is, is seemed to be softening about this as well. So, Mr President, if you're watching or if you're an aide to, to Mr President, please say, look, John says wear a mask for goodness sake. And take if, if he started wearing a mask all the time in public, that would immediately remove this political aspect to mask wearing and would immediately... Um, reduce the transmission of cases in the United States. That would happen just straight away. Now, thought, thinking about the um, the individual states now and the, uh, the, the the R values that we've looked at before. So here we have the current situation. Now. This is the, the, the uh, RT. This is the, the transmission rate in real time. So we see at the moment the highest state with a R value of 1.43. And of course, you know what that means now. It's well over one. This is bad. Nevada, highest transmission rates at the moment. Idaho is the second, 1.41. With these transmission rates, we're going to get doubling of cases in, in, in fairly short time intervals. Wyoming 1.35, Montana 1.33, Florida 1.31. So um, obviously I always post the link to these sites, so go, go and look at them. Um, but it's not till we get down here where states are actually in the green. But even, even there in Kentucky, it's, it's basically one, it's, it's 0.99. Um, it's not until we get to places like uh, Connecticut where the number of infections will actually be dropping off significantly. So what we're seeing is this, not only are we seeing this um, great increase in uh, cases overall, we're seeing the number of cases increasing in the vast majority of states. So please wear face coverings. This is believed to work. The Surgeon General is convinced if, uh, if Mr. President wore a mask, then um, I believe that would take the political aspect out of this and save cases and save lives. And it costs nothing. <laughs> you know, America's supposed to be largely about profit and business. This costs nothing. You know, this is free, <laughs> essentially free. Do, do it. Save billions, billions from the economy. And, and save potentially tens of thousands of lives, just wear these masks. So the worst affected states, we've kind of looked at that. Um, again, more references there. Alabama, now now there was reports in Alabama on, on the news. Um, I think it was, I can't remember what news it was now. NBC News, NBC Nightly News. Of, of uh, college students having parties trying to get deliberately infected. Now I can't understand that. I, 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 I hope that's not true. Um, do let me know if it is. But uh, very alarming because nationally what we're seeing in the States is, is young people are becoming the, the main drivers of infection. They are passing the infection between each other and on to more vulnerable, uh, more vulnerable individuals. Florida, as we've seen, increasing cases, increasing deaths. Arizona. Now, Arizona, this, 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 this isn't good. 30% of tests are coming back positive. So this means that the rate of increase in Arizona is, is, is really quite substantial. As we know, it is in other states that we looked at before, such as, uh, such as Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. Um, yeah, that's a lot of tests to come back positive. That means there's an awful lot of COVID-19 virus around in the community. And the spokesman I heard on the news, on the, it was um, NBC, I think, um, hospital capacity, he said, was maxed out. I'm not quite sure what maxed out means, but it doesn't sound good to me. Now, New York is doing quite well. They had a much more progressive opening and people are wearing masks in New York. 
So from being an epicenter, New York is now a bit of a, a leading light in the country. So that is encouraging. Texas, uh, now in Texas, just for an example, 7,000 people are now hospitalised and the hospitals are really under quite severe stress at that. And the governor of Texas, I understand to begin with, he was dragging his heels very significantly on the, significantly on the mask wearing front, but now he's mandated it. So wearing masks is now mandated all over the state of Texas, thank goodness. Because when it's mandated by the governor, that takes away the political component. And it just becomes a public health matter. Because you know what? It is just a public health matter. So after initial resistance is now mandated statewide mask wearing in public places. Outside in, in well-ventilated areas is less of a risk. It's inside, it's shops, it's supermarkets that are the problem or superstores, I'm not quite sure what you call them in the States. And uh, is imposing uh, $300 fines, so I suspect that is being complied with. South Carolina, now again, these are anecdotal reports, but increasing numbers of young people hospitalized in South Carolina. And there has been several cases of this from around the United States. Now, what is going on here? Is it just that there's so many more cases that the percentage of young people um, is inevitably going to increase just because by the sheer number of cases? Because we always knew that some young people are affected. It's just a smaller percentage than older people. But with so many people being affected in the community, we're going to see larger overall numbers of young people, of course. Is it just that or is there something else going on? Um, is there some other reason why young people are becoming more affected and more hospitalised. Now, we need more data on this, and we certainly need data if there's any deaths in younger people or the proportion of deaths in younger people. But that that was concerning. And when senior doctors go on, on the air to, to, to vent these fears, um, OK, it's, st it's still anecdotal, but it's not, it's not good. It's concerning. California's rolled back. Bar cinemas closed again. Los Angeles beaches closed for the 4th of July. Now, <clears throat> to be fair... This is kind of, let me tell you what I'm thinking. Um, beaches, you get plenty of vitamin D from the sun and they're open spaces. And they're, by definition, of course, well ventilated with sea breezes. But people get close together. But perhaps it's not so much the beach itself. It's the toilets that service the beach. It's the facilities around about the beach. It's the, it's the apre beach, what you do after you've been to the beach. And, and all the, the, the congestion that can go around with that is probably more of an issue. So the authorities in Los Angeles presumably have taken all these things into cognizance and they've decided to close the beaches for the 4th of July, which is a big thing, of course. This is a huge thing uh, in American culture to do. Now, I've been looked at some alarming reports about people being billed huge amounts of money in the States. And we did have a we did have a, a mention yesterday of how expensive some of the drugs were in the States. Now, I've done, I've done a quick survey on this, and I, I really must talk to someone who knows what they're talking about. But this uh, news site here, this NBC, NBC news site, says 32% of working Americans currently have medical debt, and 28% owe more than $10,000, a huge amount of money. So quite what's going on there, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but... I think it varies a lot from state to state, but the financial burden that people could be encumbered with after their emergency care in COVID-19 pandemic, again, could have effects for, for decades into the future and is really quite concerning. Now, there's an old saying in science that a little bit of theory can undermine an awful lot of practice. And I'm hoping that this bears true in relation to the effects of the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States. And particularly, I've got some information from New York. Now, at the time, these started, you might remember, on about the 28th of May, I expressed a lot of concern that the crowding and people shouting would cause aerosolization of the virus. And I was fearful and indeed predicted there would be an increase in cases. But it looks like I'm being proved wrong on that, which, of course... I'm absolutely delighted about. So let's look at that and see why I'm hoping to, to be wrong. 
So the epidemiologists were braced for a surge of new coronavirus cases in New York, particularly as a result of these ongoing and crowded protests. But the increase in cases, it has to be said, has not yet come. So this is remarkably good news. And let, let's hope I continue to be proved wrong as the empirical data starts to come out. But there are a few caveats, as we'll see. Now, on May 28th, the spread in New York was already slowing down. So you remember that New York had quite draconian lockdown measures and that had really reduced the rate of the virus. And the benefits carried on from these. So for the people that were tested in New York in June, the proportion of those testing positive of those that were tested went down from 3% to 2%. So really quite an encouraging drop. So why have I got this wrong if, if indeed I have got it wrong? Well, I think there's some factors to take into account that I perhaps didn't take into account sufficiently. And let's look at these now. And the first is, because of this substantial drop that had already occurred up to the 28th of May, the number of cases in the community in New York was relatively low. That means that any individual's risk of encountering another a person who's infected was relatively low. So relatively low risk of encountering a case because of the good work that had been done over the past couple of months in New York. So that's one possible region, reason. Having said that, there's limited regional data from New York. So New York, there's kind of data for all of New York, but it's not really broken down into demographics and segments. So that's kind of still a question mark yet. It could have been that without the protest, the, the rate would have declined even faster. Of course, we don't know that. Now, these protests uh, were organised and uh, the organisers correctly distributed masks. So the New York Times is clear that the uh, protest organisers were distributing masks to those that uh, pitched up for the protest. So that's another good thing. Given that the protests were, occur were occurring, better to wear masks than not. Now, another good thing was there was a lot of moving about. So people were moving around outside. They weren't standing in one place. So very often as they were protesting, they were marching along and walking along. Now, what I don't know, I would be interested if someone who was at those marches would tell me this, actually, how windy it was on those days of the protest. Because if it was quite breezy in New York, that would be blowing the droplets and the viruses away. But the fact that people were moving around is a good sign because the virus wouldn't have time to concentrate in the particular areas. And of course, the biggie, the main factor by far and away, is the fact that the protests were outdoors. Now, recently, we've seen an awful lot of spread in the United States. And a lot of it has been put down to bars, people indoors in a bar, talking into each other's faces, that's the highest risk situation. So even although there was crowding here, because it was outdoors, the risk is massively less. So if you need to do things at the moment that involve interacting with other people, do them outdoors. And the fact that it was outdoors and they were moving around means there was a significant dilution effect so the virus that any infected person was breathing out, that was greatly diluted. And to get infected with this viral infection, if you get one or two viruses, that's not going to cause infection. That There's an infective dose. You have to get a certain number of viral particles into you. Now, what that number of viral particles is, you can't quantify it because it will depend on the immune state of the individual. So someone who's got good levels of immunity, good levels of local immunity, might require um, a relatively high viral dose to be infected. Someone with poor levels of immunity, who, for example, has another infection or is malnourished, they could be infected with a much lower dose of the virus. But nevertheless, the point remains that there is an infective dose. And hopefully, because it was outside, this infective dose was not reached. Now, having said that... Minnesota, which of course was the epicentre of, of the protests, there's been an increase in cases of COVID-19 in young adults as June has progressed, now into July of course. So was this caused by the protests 
Or was it caused by the fact that the bars reopened as well? And I think it's because the bars reopened. So the data from New York indicates that the protests in Minnesota would have a lesser effect. The opening of the bars being indoors, people talking together, talking loudly after a few drinks, closer contact after a few drinks. I think the bars was probably the bigger, the bigger factor. But having said that, the data is limited. We have limited data. Now, Andrew Como, you might remember, governor of New York, he dedicated 15 testing sites to people who've been at protests. And interestingly, after all this time, after more than a month in some cases, the data from these testing sites is not yet available. Make what you will of that, but this data is not yet available. Many protesters were young adults, therefore less likely to be symptomatic. Now, this is interesting. So if uh, someone contracts the disease, then it's probably going to be, say, about a week until they develop their first symptoms. It could be two weeks, of course. And then they're going to be capable of transmitting the disease. But if many people are asymptomatic, that means they could transmit the disease to another young person who was also asymptomatic for a week. And then they could transmit it to an older person who was more prone to becoming symptomatic and more prone to catch the disease after another week. Then it takes that person another week to incubate the illness, then another week to get seriously ill. So we end up with very long delay effects. So someone with low risk of symptomatic disease spreads the disease to someone else with low sim risk of symptomatic disease to someone else potentially with low risk of symptomatic disease who spreads it to someone who can get symptoms and die. That, that's, that's possible. So the, the, the lag effect in these things is often much longer than you would expect by adding together the incubation period and the symptomatic period. It can be a much longer effect than that because it goes from A to B to C before it gets to D. So that, that's, that's another possibility. Um, so we, we may not know yet. So there's the lack of specific data on the testing sites is the fact that people were young and might still be passing it around amongst asymptomatics. City officials have instructed tracers not to ask new COVID-19 patients if they attended the protests. Now, the New York Times did quote a source for that, and it did seem to be reliable. Now, if that's the case, it means city officials are being deliberately obtuse, unteachable. They don't want to know this. Now, to me, any information, any data is good data. So if this is the case... If, if officials in New York are deliberately deciding to turn a blind eye to this, then there's a whole tranche of epidemiological data they are choosing not to collect. And this is a pity. This really is a pity because this could be done without identifying any individuals. This could be done completely anonymously. We do this in research all the time. To in, we, have, we have ways of ensuring that people remain anonymous while we still collect data on groups of people. But it looks like if that case is true, and, and, and if you're a New York City official and it's not true, do tell me. But um, that's what the New York Times is reporting. And then there's this other sort of weird thing we've got. This is Professor Markle, historian and physician, University of Michigan. And, and this again, this was quoted in the New York Times. And uh, the professor said, like most every other aspect of this pandemic, the most predictable thing is the unpredictability. We are indeed dealing with a weird virus, unfortunately. So that's the state of play from the, uh, the New York protest situation. I'm hoping to be proved wrong. I'm hoping I'm proved wrong, but basically we don't know yet. But I just wanted to do that in a bit of detail because I thought there's some interesting, interesting principles involved in that discussion. Now, you might remember a few weeks ago, we had David on from Ag Unity. And one of the things that organization is doing, and, and I will post links, of course, it's an excellent organization. One of the things they are doing are these superb infographic posters. I just love these infographic posters. And they are working at the moment. Uh, this report is particularly from Indonesia. Now, of course, I don't speak the local language, but does it matter? You can kind of see what these means. Keep your hands clean, stay in your own household, wear a face covering. 
um, we could all we could really use these pictures without without any explanatory uh, text, uh, such as the power of the the infographic. And these are all over the place. This is how many people can become infected. Um, so again, you know, ve very useful graphical information. I think this is the I think this was the R value. So if the R value is two point five, you're going to get that many in thirty days. One person is going to become that many in five days, that many in 30 days. If the R value is 1.5, one person is going to become 1.5 in five days and that many. But if you've got the uh, the R value down to 0.5, the number of cases is going to reduce. So the, 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 the sort of fairly powerful um, graphics there. And that one, again, you really don't need language, do you? You can see this guy sneezing these droplets out. Hence the need for the two meter separation. Simple, powerful uh, messages. Other parts of Indonesia. This one's clearly about crowding at markets. And again, even without the language, you can see, you can see what it means. I can't zoom in on this program, but um, you can see what it means. That one again, very useful. Again, these, these are going up all around Indonesia. Excellent. Looks like these gentlemen are uh, erecting the poster. <laughs> Good. Yeah, in between two uh, palm trees. <laughs> yeah, proper respiratory hygiene. proper hand washing techniques because these are all huge posters so they're like proper public information things such a simple idea but such a great initiative so it looks like if you live in Indonesia <laughs> you're not going to be ignorant you know most of the messages are just so simple we just need to keep reinforcing them Excellent level of mask wearing here with these, uh, this family. Ah, looks like some planting going on as well. You get no argument from me as a horticult, well, pretend horticulturalist, would be horticulturalist. So these are all different parts of uh, Indonesia. David, we'll have to have David back on again. Very interesting discussion. I'll post a link to the uh, to the original video where we talked to David. Well, I'm convinced these are all over Indonesia now. Are you? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That one looks like it's about temperature. Risk of risk of spread. Low lowest, of course, if. Yeah, so, so so the risk of spread, if you're wearing a mask and the, the infected person is not, you get some protection. If the infected person is wearing a mask and the non-infected person is not wearing a mask, you get more protection. So you see, that's how dangerous it is. They're, they're saying that's right in the red. But uh, if neither, if, if both people are wearing masks, even better. So that, that's a nice, very simple way to illustrate that. Yeah, we see that one again. A powerful illustration that actually I haven't seen that one before. Makes a nice change from beer adverts, doesn't it? Don't know if we've seen them all yet. <laughs> Looks like he's got plenty of pictures. I think we're getting the idea anyway though public health campaign in, in Indonesia. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So I think that's us for uh, this one. Uh, now I've got plenty of other news from the UK and other countries, so we'll put that on a separate uh, video, I think.